I hooked up with Ainsley Dunsbar. I was supposed to start a band with him on drums, Tim Bogart on bass, and Ronnie Montrose on lead guitar and me on vocals. It was my dream band. Hey, Mark, how's it going? I'm good. Good, good, good. Um, so when I do these, I like to start at the beginning of you as a musician and then work our way up to the new record. Um, so starting from the beginning, where did you grow up and how did you get started in music? Well, I grew up in northeastern Ohio area. Youngstown, Ohio is where I was born and grew up in a suburb of Youngstown called Hubbard. And how I got started in music? Well, uh, my parents were churchgoers and my mom used to play piano. My dad played trumpet and my dad actually was friends with Hank Williams Sr., and uh, but he kind of uh, left that behind when he got married to my mom. But he would talk about him sometimes, and he was always uh, they were always playing music in the house and and in church. And I started singing in church when I was five. I started singing solos. I just uh, I guess I can't remember not ever wanting to be a singer. I started playing uh, bass guitar. I don't remember why that happened, but um, who were some early vocal influences on you? What were you listening to a lot of in the early days? Well, I was listening to Eb. You know, I mean, I <laughs> I go back a long way. So I was listening to AM radio. There was there wasn't anything on FM when I was when I was a little boy, uh, and I had the AM radio glued to my ear all the time. Which at that time, the playlists on on the radio stations were just about anything and everything. You know, you'd hear Tom Jones, James Brown, the Beatles all the British invasion groups and uh, it was all, they didn't really have a set format. It was just all pop top 100 or whatever it was back then. Top 40. I remember um, talking to Jeff Tate at Queensryche and he, I remember him saying very much the same thing. He's like, you'd go from Motown to the Beatles to exactly. the who to whatever, you know, it was, it was almost like free form in a sense. Um, I, I was kind of shocked when I was doing research about you. The first thing I'm aware of you doing is Ingve, but I didn't realize you had also worked with Savoy Brown and Ted Nugent. H how did you originally come to join uh, Savoy Brown? Or I hope I'm saying his name right. Yeah, well, that's uh, actually the British blues band. They were actually really big in this, in 1973. They was their peak, I guess. But uh, Kim Simmons was a guitar player of that, and he's he was influential on a lot of guitar players uh, that came afterwards. How did I hook up with them? Well, he he's a British guy, but he moved to Ohio for some odd reason. And uh, he's always had a rotating door with band members for many, many years after, uh, you know, uh, in the 70s, the two of the guys formed Foghat were, were his original members, too. Oh, I didn't realize that. Interesting. The British blues scene, kind of the same deal. It's the kind of same kind of music. Anyway, uh, he was doing a some recordings up in a studio in Cleveland where I was doing some demos too. And uh, he was looking for a, a bass player that could sing lead as he had been working with Tim Bogart uh, for a while. And uh, who was a great singer and bass player from, you know, Vanilla Fudge and Beck Bogart and Appis. And yeah. So I took his place. Uh, I got, I auditioned, I got the gig and started playing around blues clubs in New York, Chicago, Texas, around all over the United States. And then that led to Ted Nugent because I was playing at the Texas Jam and Ted Nugent came out to see the show as a lot of guitar players did come to see Kim Simmons. And uh, he needed a bass player and that could sing. So that's how that happened. That's hilarious. So when you joined Ted, were, were you also the lead singer or were you a second backing singer for him? Well, it... It's a little complicated. He hired me as to be the lead singer, but uh, the, he got dropped by the label Epic that he was on for many years and got picked up by Atlantic. And Atlantic had the idea of, uh, they brought in a, a producer from England and they wanted to make him sound like Foreigner, which in the end, it didn't work out. That was the Penetrator record, which I was supposed to be on, but the songs that we had kind of prepared for that album never got on the album. They were uh, they put songs by outside writers and they brought in a singer from England called Brian Howe. Uh, he's, has, he passed away, unfortunately, but he was with uh, Bad Company for a while while Paul Rogers was at Bad Company. Um, so yeah. you, you, I take it, were you after Charlie Hunt? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he, I, I think he would have been, what, 80, early 80s, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So when, when were you with Ted then? This would have been, what, 83, 84, something like that? 84, yeah. Oh, okay. Now, did did you guys did you do any major tours with anyone at the time? Yeah, yeah. We toured with Judas Priest uh, that year. 
Oh, wow. So that would have been Defenders of the Faith Tour. Yeah, I guess so. It's kind of a monster robot on the cover or something. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. How how is it how is it touring with those guys? Oh, they were really cool. They're they are they were a machine. I mean, it was just exactly the same great show every night. They never never fell down. Never I mean, Rob, what a great singer, man. And and the whole band was tight. They were tight. I became a huge I was I was just kind of a, a, a peripheral fan of them, but after doing the tour with them, I became a huge fan of them and friends. They they were really nice people too. Oh, that's awesome. So what happened between Ted and Ingve? How do you go from his band into joining Ingve's band? Well, I got a divorce after, <laughs> after I went on tour with Ted and I came home. Things were not as copacetic. They were not happening. And uh, so I moved to LA and uh, started doing some demos and recording around. And uh, I hooked up with Ainsley Dunsbar. I was supposed to start a band with him on drums, Tim Bogart on bass, and Ronnie Montrose on lead guitar and me on vocals. Wow. Oh, I'm a massive Montrose fan, so that's so cool. I, I never knew that little bit of history. It was my dream band, but uh, Montrose disappeared then. He did one of his disappearing acts, and nobody knew where he went, and so that kind of fell through the cracks. And at the time, that's the, the same time it was Ainsley was recording the, the big White Snake album as a ghost player, but eventually it came out that he played on it. <laughs> but yeah, he hooked me up with uh, Ingbe's management. Uh, Jeff Scott Soto had quit the band to do something else, and uh, they needed somebody right away to uh, go on tour for the Marching Out album with Ingbe. And so I, uh, the first show was at Oakland Stadium, uh, Day on the Green, 80,000 people live on MTV. And then we went from there, we went on tour with ACDC for a year. And then we went back in the studio and did the trilogy album and uh, went out with ACDC again. Wow. Okay. So, so back to Day on the Green for a second. So, was that Day on the Green 85? Yes. Yeah. With minimal rehearsal, believe me, all we played at rehearsal with Deep Purple songs. Because <laughs> <laughs> no matter what he says, he's the biggest Richie Blackmore fan that there is. Yeah, so. yeah, I, th I saw that a little while ago where he said something about how he's not, you know, he wasn't really influenced by him. And I'm like, okay, come on, like, come on, you know, I don't, I don't get that either. Um, so tell me this. So jumping forward, I think it would probably have been a year or two later. So after you're done with Ingve for the first stint, you did the Restless Heart movie. How did you come to be involved with that and working with Mike Slammer from City Boy? Well, I just started writing songs with him, uh, just started uh, doing some stuff. And then I, I started actually doing some, uh, what they call, it's voiceover, but it's not really voiceover, voiceover. It's off-screen singer kind of deal. So I started working at Warner Brothers Studio for a while, singing on for TV shows and stuff. They they do sound alike songs back in those days with the uh, with the studio orchestra there in the big giant room. Did that for a while. Oh, so like what what films have you done, that kind of thing? That's crazy. I never knew you did that. Uh, it was some CBS TV shows that never <laughs> <laughs> it was called Houston Nights, uh, which had like one or two seasons. Uh, it was just different things. But uh, I uh, to do that job, you have to be on call all the time. You can't be like out of town or doing other things or they just call the next guy on the list and they don't call you anymore. So I couldn't really do that for very long. Maybe uh, I would have been much better off financially if I did because that's a very lucrative uh, thing. Uh, the musicians that do that, they, they do like 80 pieces of music a day. And you get paid royalties every time that stuff plays on TV or movies or whatever. So, Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, yes, but it's uh, you, you were tied into that forever if you want to do that. You can't just do it like dip your toes into it. You have to dive in. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I, I tasted that a little bit of that world for a while so was this another thing where you're just on the list and mike slammer happened to be the guy doing that movie song that day kind of thing no no actually i had done the, a demo of the song with him in his studio and then they ended up re-recording it in for the movie in, in with the other band it, it's an orchestra really i mean it's like 40 people in there but they you know they made it kind of sound generic and uh it wasn't as heavy as what me and mike recorded in his studio but we never we never released it, so uh, we just it was in demo stages. Yeah, well, it's, there's there's a demo. It's funny I've been listening to that demo for many years off YouTube, because um, I I didn't even realize at first when I heard the song it was you. Like I'm a big City Boy fan, oh, and okay. just having a stumble on that song, I go, oh, Mike Slammer, I go, oh, that 
oh, a great singer, whatever, cool song, awesome. And then was doing research for this and went, wait, n- no, that can't be the same thing. Sure enough, it was the same song that, you know, I'd heard and liked many years prior. Right. So tell me this now. So I'll just just be upfront about this. One of my favorite things you've done is Billionaire Boys Club. And it's something I don't know anything about. Tell me about doing that record like it was, you know, it was Jorg from uh, Accept on guitar. You had two other members of Ingve's band playing on it. How did that record come together? Was that a project or was that a proper band? Well, we tried to make it a proper band, but um, it was one of those deals. Actually, the, the bass player was never in Ingve's band, but he was a Swedish guy, Magnus. But uh, Anders was the drummer from Ingve I played with for years. And York, the thing that happened, we made the the record and then we went to do some touring stuff and i don't know really what happened i never dug into it to find out because Jorg disappeared and nobody knew where he was for years <laughs> i don't think they still there used to be a website like uh this was titled where is Jorg fisher oh that's hilarious and i don't, <laughs> I don't know if anybody found him. i don't know what happened uh nobody uh they didn't find nobody thinks he's dead but they just don't know where he is but Getting back to that album, that was, <laughs> we recorded that on a 16 track and it was kind of like just having fun, but it came out really good, I thought. And I, I really love that album too. I, I, it's one of my favorites, personally. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, so pretty much you guys do the album and then the whole thing, like he disappears and it just came and went and that was it, eh? Yeah, everybody started doing other things. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it, the music business is tough. It's it's not like to be a rock star unless you're in the top ten. It's not very easily to make a living and uh, and have a good living. You got to keep working all the time. So when when something stops working, you have to find something else that works. Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, so kind of on that note and speaking of that, um, so tell me about this project. How did you get involved with Empire? out of Germany in the early 2000s? Because you, you did a couple things with Lion Music at the time, eh? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was through Anders. Uh, Anders Johansson hooked me up with uh, the guys, with those guys. And it was it was just, I'm guessing, probably just an internet project, eh? Hey, can you sing on a few songs? Yeah. Gosh, I don't even know how we traded files then, because I guess there was internet. There must have been. <laughs> <laughs> just It just took forever to download the track, I'm guessing. Right, right. <laughs> yeah i think it was there was dial-up it was the dial-up internet yeah i, I remember uh at that time being the only person on my block with high speed and everybody coming to me going oh my god you mean you can you can download a song in less than an hour what is this <laughs> <I know. laughs> so uh tell me this so you worked with uli for i think it was a couple years correct like you toured with him for a few years and then you did under a dark sky Tell me about sort of how you came to join him, you know, working on that record, that kind of thing. Well, I I ran into him at uh, music school, uh, MI Music School in Hollywood. He would do his guitar clinics. Uh, He would come around every year and do some intensive guitar clinics. You know, he calls it Sky Guitar. He's a fantastic teacher, actually. He, He really, I watched him do those clinics and he's really, really good with kids and, and putting them on the right path instead of uh, the path that they all choose to go to the shredding as much distortion as possible path that they all. But uh, somebody asked me to sing a song with him. It wasn't him. Cause I, when I sang with him the first time, I didn't know him yet. So it must've been somebody at the school. And uh, you know, I sang sales of Sharon with him and, and he was like, well, oh, you sound like the real deal. Let's uh, let's work together. <laughs> <laughs> Just that simple. You both happen to be at the music school, and okay, let's do it. Yeah, that's that's how I remember it. I don't remember anything else. I just remember the first time singing with him as was at MI there, and and I didn't know him yet, so that had to be the introduction. And that would have been probably mid two thousand, something like that. I'm guessing. Yes, probably oh five or oh six, something like that. Yeah. Okay. And then, so did you tour with him for a couple of years before um, Under a Dark Sky? Yes, I did a few t- Taranaki Festival in New Zealand and things like that. And uh, then, <laughs> you know, at the time he was living in a castle in Germany, 57-room castle with a seven-bedroom guest house. But we, we all stayed in the castle and, and he recorded the whole thing there. We recorded the orchestra there and everything. 
the only problem with the album in the end in my opinion was he mixed it himself and he should have trusted that to somebody else but um he just you know a lot of musicians i mean he's a he's one of the legends of guitar players he's incredible virtuoso and not only on the guitar he can play any instrument there is i mean i've heard him he's a virtuoso on violin and cello and piano and just about anything that's unbelievable yeah i'm a massive massive uli fan i didn't realize he like i knew obviously he's insane on guitar but i didn't realize he was that talented which makes sense given all the composing work and other stuff he does yeah uh <laughs> i didn't know either and he's not a he, he's not a show-off you know he doesn't tell people things I just, I, I was up on the third floor of the castle and I heard a violin playing, kind of like the young Frankenstein movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so where's that coming from? And so I, I was searching it out and I, I went downstairs and, and I saw it was him playing and it was incredible. He was saying, oh yes, I've got to keep my chops up. I've got to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Did did you ever meet his brother at all, Zeno? Never met him. Uh, he was talked about, he was never around when I was around though. Uh, I think they had a strained relationship. It's you know, I think sometimes they got along and sometimes they didn't. I don't know the, all the details. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so tell me then. So writing and recording that album was that like uh, Uli had everything already done for it, and it was pretty much just sing your parts kind of thing, or was it more collaborative? The co collaboration was not that much because he had he already had everything mapped out. He, I mean, he. <laughs> I asked him, I because he, he said, uh, well, he's had the melodies and the lyrics and everything. I said, well, give me the sheet music. He said, oh, no, no, you can't read music. I said, yes, I do. Yes, I used to do it. I, used to do it. I can sight read vocal lines, no problem. He said, oh, that's not rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, it is. And so, yeah, he gave, so I had him give me lead sheets and I just recorded the stuff uh, there. And, you know, he has a lot, of, he has a, enough, of Jimi Hendrix's equipment to start a Jimi Hendrix museum, which he's been talking about doing because uh, his wife who passed away was Monica Daneman and she was Jimi Hendrix's last girlfriend. So he's got his guitars and some microphones and a lot of clothes and a lot, a lot of stuff, everything that she had that she got from Jimi. So, Oh, that's crazy. No, um, uh, Helga, who engineers last couple records from Fair Warning, he's a friend of mine. So his his line about Uli is Uli at least once a day says, "Ah, there's not enough Hendrix here. Needs <laughs> needs to be more Hendrix." Yeah, yeah. Well, he, uh, he I mean, he took one of Hendrix's scarves and wrapped it around the microphone when I was singing. He said, "You need the vibe. You need the Hendrix vibe." I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, i love hendrix no problem yeah <laughs> that's great so i uh, had heard that you guys were going to do another <laughs> record is that true i i would love to but i haven't heard of that so he's been touring with a bunch of young younger guys and uh he's not you know he's a great fantastic guy but he's he's never good at making money uh, he never makes money when he tours <laughs> he's always hurting for money and uh you know, so I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is, but I would love to work with him. I'd love to do another album with him. I'd love to. I love the guy. He's a fantastic guy. He a great, great musician. What an honor to work with someone like that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, Uli really is his own being. You know, there's not many people like him. Well, he's got the sky guitar. It's 32 frets. <laughs> I said, why do you need that many frets? Well, we've got to play in notes that only dogs can hear <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh it's funny because helga again he he was i think like the second person to ever get a sky guitar that uli gave him in the 80s uh -huh. and so he also plays with a sky guitar and it's funny uh, go and see uli and it's just like oh it's like listening to fair warning oh yeah because they both use sky guitars and you can cl it's so obvious listening to their guitar solos because they're playing registers you never hear in a solo right so uh tell me this then so the first time i ever saw you play live and met you was at prog power uh god i think it was 2009 with royal hunt okay how did you get hooked up with those guys obviously being from i think they're from germany if i'm not mistaken yeah, no, they're from Denmark, actually. Denmark, that's it. Okay. Based out of Copenhagen. And that was Frontiers, actually. Uh, Serafino told me that they were looking for a singer. And uh, so I, there's a couple of my demo tapes I put up there that I, my audition for them, I sang uh, two or three songs and uh, sent them a recording. I don't know if I sent them a CD or whatever, but anyway, I, those are on, up on YouTube, <laughs> my auditions for, for Royal Hunt. So you'll see how I got the gig. 
I'll have to check them out. That's great. Um, and you guys did, it was two records, I believe, right? Yes. Together? Yes. How, how was it working with those guys? Was, was it just purely internet back and forth, or did you guys all get together? In a oh, studio no, no. Kind of thing? I went to Den- uh, Copenhagen and hung out there and, and recorded the albums. Every, everything I recorded with them was recorded there in Copenhagen. The first album I did with them, I, I kind of liked better than the second one because uh, Marcus Jadel was a guitar player, and I really like his work. He he left the band because of, of he he wanted to be a more of a he wanted to contribute more he wanted to be a writer uh, on some of the stuff and and Andre is great it's his band and he writes everything he writes everything every bit of the music and everything and so some of the players that he had have left as a result of that because some people want to you know be have their fingers in it more and I left because the way he was doing things. I didn't feel like I fit the, after the second album, I didn't feel like I fit that style as well as, uh, I told him to get, he should have get DC Cooper back because I thought he was perfect for that kind of Scandinavian kind of sound that they have, which uh, is great. I mean, I, I still get along great with him and I, I've done a couple of uh, guest appearances on their later albums too. Great band and uh, great people. But I just, at some point, I felt like I wasn't contributing enough also, so. For sure. Yeah, it makes sense. Plus, too, I mean, being international like that, too, I'm sure, makes it difficult. You know, anytime you guys go to do something, there's a 10-hour plane ride involved. Yeah, I love Copenhagen. It's a great city, man. It's a great city. It's right across the water from, you just drive across the bridge and you're in Malmo, Sweden. Sweden is, Sweden and and Denmark are two of my favorite places. Oh, it's amazing. I, I know how unbelievably beautiful they are as countries. Just incredible. Okay, so uh, in the last couple of years, you know, before we jump to the new Ring of Fire, you know, I'm a fan of uh, Labyrinth and Vision Divine, and you did two really great records with Olive Thorson. Uh, tell me how this band came together and what the writing process was like. Well, I had known Olaf because I was supposed to be a singer in Labyrinth when Roberto left the band, but I had some personal issues. I had, I'd watched my best friend die right in front of me while I was starting to work on the record with them, and uh, I just I couldn't work for a good six months to a year. I just couldn't work. I was just in a real bad depression and uh, Roberto came back. So then I wasn't, I didn't do that album with the labyrinth and then, but uh, we stayed in touch uh, Olaf and myself and uh, there came an opportunity to do this project for frontiers. And so, so we said, yeah, let's try it. Let's give it a go and see what happens. And uh, it turns out I really love working with uh, Olaf and uh, I love the two albums. I'm proud of those albums, and I, I love working with Olaf. I hope we can do more. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's talk the new Ring of Fire. I've got to say, I'm a huge fan of this. I've been playing it nonstop for the last uh, two weeks or so since I've had the promo. Thanks. You've got, um, I, th- I think this is Aldo's first album with you guys, right? Yes. Yeah. You know, so you've got Aldo, who, I mean, the man's quickly becoming one of my favorite songwriters as of recent. He's done a lot of great stuff. Mm-hmm. You've got your longtime Ring of Fire keyboardist, uh, Vitaly Kuprich. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Probably not. Vitaly Kupri. Kupri. Um, <laughs> it's, Ukrainian. It's, it's a Ukrainian name. Yeah. Oh, okay. So tell me how this record came together. Like, was this done largely during COVID? Was this sort of after as things had opened up or you know tell me about how this whole record came together well we started working on it uh, i guess last summer um we just started uh, bouncing around ideas and uh it got kind of delayed uh i was kind of finished with my parts in the fall or in the fall and winter but uh, vitaly is he's plays with uh, trans-siberian orchestra so he's out uh, he can't do anything uh, for a good four months. So they they do a lot of pre-production and then there's a three-month tour. It got held up and then like January, February, we started finishing up, putting the finishing touches on on the whole thing. And so it's been it's been in the can since uh, springtime at least. Oh wow, okay, so it's it's been sitting for a while now. Um, how did you get hooked up with Aldo for the record? Was that uh, Serafino suggesting him? Yeah, it's, yeah, Serafino hooked me up with him because I we, we wanted, of course, uh, Tony McAlpine to do it again, but it wasn't he wasn't available this time. He has a manager now that's really pushing him to only do his solo instrumental stuff. So uh, it's not like he didn't want to do it, but he's kind of forced to not do it. So Serafino recommended a few guys. And when I came across Aldo, I said, oh, yeah, that's the guy. Let's do Let's use him. So, 
Yeah. Something I really love about this record, like you've almost got kind of two realms of songs. You know, half the record is like very progressive, you know, very sort of Symphony X, Royal Hunt, you know, that kind of thing, like Storm of the Ponds. Mm -hmm. And then other, other ones are almost like balls to the wall power metal you know, run for your life, uh, melancholia, stuff like that. Was that kind of the plan? Um, or did the songs just kind of, you know, sort of grow from that? Yeah, we didn't really have a plan to do that, but that's how, that's how the songs came together in the end. Um, Vitaly is, he's a fantastic uh, concert classical pianist and uh, he loves to show off those chops. And uh, I love it too. We come up with something that sounds uh, quite different. Um, I don't. I think some of the songs you mentioned, though, cross over between the two, so it's not exactly that cut and dry. For sure. Oh yeah. I mean, some of them, you know, you go from this long progressive package or passage to just something right in your face. You know. Yeah. It's. Uh, I think. Yeah. I, I'm happy with the result. I'm proud of the album. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think it's fantastic. I mean, especially you know, you've got you've got people. You know, you've got like Aldo, for example, in another part of the world, and I mean, it's so seamless. The whole record. Like it, it sounds like you guys had been working in a room for months to get that record out. I think it, I mean, it speaks too to just the overall musicianship of the record. I mean, everybody's on fire, you know, with that album. Mark, are you still there? Hey, I, I don't know what happened. Everything went black and the internet went off. I'm on a ship, by the way. I'm in oh, the Oh, really? Oh, wow. So, <laughs> it's been going fine. It's been working fine. I don't know what happened there. Just everything went black. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Um, so let's, we'll, uh, we'll quickly uh, wrap this up then. So other than this new Ring of Fire and the recent Shining Black album, uh, what do you guys have uh, in the pipe, or what do you have in the pipeline? Is there anything you can let us know about? Uh, nothing I want to say anything about now, but I'm, I'm always working, I'm always writing. Um, there's going to be some solo stuff coming from me soon and some other stuff too. And uh, I really want to get on the road in uh, 23 next year. With hopefully with the Ring of Fire, I want to do some stuff with that them, and uh, I want to do another um, Shining Black album also. So there's going to be stuff coming, but I can't really say right now. Oh, that's fantastic! So pretty much punch your name into Google every now and again and see what's coming up. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, you can always look at my uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram and uh, website markbowlsofficial.com. Okay, awesome. Well, Mark, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out to do this. And I mean, the fact that you're doing this from a ship right now <laughs> blows my mind. And, you know, the, the connection overall has been been quite good. Um, it's been the odd dropout, but otherwise it's been great. Yeah, it's usually good. Uh, as long as the weather's good here. So I'm, I'm just off the coast of Puerto Rico at the moment. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I want to thank you so much for that. I'm looking forward to what you have coming up in the pipeline. And, you know, uh, congrats on the fantastic new Ring of Fire album. It's killer. And, you know, I hope we get another one, something in that vein. I mean, they all kind of have been. So, yeah, it's just going to get better because uh, we get, you know, we're getting back into it again. So, uh, yeah, look forward. Th thank you for liking the album. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. And, yeah, I'll keep an eye out for you on the road. Um, do you think you'll hit uh, North America at all? With Ring of Fire or is it mostly Europe? Uh, if we can, we will. You know, it's probably going to be Japan and Europe for sure. And I would love to play some dates in America. I just have to see if we can arrange it. If we can swing it, we will. For sure. Oh, that would be fantastic. All right, Mark. Well, thank you again. Best luck with the new stuff. And uh, yeah, hope to see you on the road at some point. Thanks. Great talking to you, man. All right. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Bye.